Hi, my name is Janine Beistwos, and in this session, I'm going to be talking about network modeling analysis uh, using a tool called FSL Nets. Uh, and specifically, this session is going to focus on how to define the nodes uh, and how to calculate the edges. So first of all, a little bit of an introduction to node-based methods in general um, and network modeling analysis in particular. Um, the first step of any node-based method um, and the first step of FSL nets is to define the nodes. So on the left in this figure here, you can see that the brain has been split up into these different regions that are made up of multiple voxels. Uh, and each of those regions is called a node. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, in this session about how to decide how to define the nodes. Uh, the next step in a node-based methods or in net and in network modeling analysis is to extract the time series. So essentially from each of the nodes, uh, we're going to average the time series across all of the voxels that are part of that node to get one representative time series for that node. The next one is to calculate the edges, uh, which is usually some form of similarity between the time series from one region and another region. Um, and so you can see on the figure in the right here where the nodes are described as the black circles with the, the numbers in them and the edges are essentially the connections between pairs of nodes. Uh, then what we can do is we can build what's called a network matrix, which is at the bottom in the left here, uh, where essentially each entry in this matrix uh, describes the strength of the uh, edge or the strength of the connectivity between a specific pair of regions. And you can combine all of the pair of pairs of regions into a node by node network matrix. Um, so starting off, I'm going to talk a little bit more about deciding how to define the nodes. Um, and I'll put up this slide with a little bit of the different words that get used because it can be a little bit confusing. Um, I'm describing a node as essentially a fundamental processing unit. So um, instead of using each individual voxel as a separate node, which would become a very computationally expensive because you would have a very large network matrix and very many potential node-to-node -node connections or edges, uh, we can simplify this a little bit by saying that uh, a number of voxels are probably probably have a similar connectivity pattern and so we can group them together in, in a node. Um, this can also be called a parcel um, and describing or determining all of the uh, nodes from the brain is um, a process called par brain parcellation and so parcel is one of the nodes. Uh, you might also hear, hear the term region of interest or ROI or ROI which is used in some different contexts, most more commonly in task fMRI than in resting state fMRI. But the idea is the same, that it's a, it's a, uh, it's a unit that you can consider as one brain region. Um, a cortical area has a much more specific definition. So a node can be a cortical area, uh, but not all nodes defi by definition meet the characteristics of a cortical area. Uh, because the cortical area is a region of cortex that is distinct from neighboring cortex in terms of function, um, cytoarchitecture, connectivity, or topographic organization. Um, and then a network can be a confusing word. Uh, a network is kind of a, an intuitive word that we use for a collection of things. Um, but within the context of resting state fMRI, the word network can, can actually refer to a lot of different levels. So, um, first of all, you might hear of network neuroscience, or you might hear of the brain as a whole being described as one network. Um, you might hear of networks being um, a subset of interconnected nodes. So if you have several hundred nodes, then like a dozen nodes might, might cluster together or be interconnected with each other to form one network, which is also known as a module in some parts of, of network neuroscience. Um, and the most, probably the most common use of, of networks is to refer to resting state networks, which are these macro scale systems uh, in the brain uh, of areas that are separated, but that are similar and kind of tend to group together um, and tend to be strongly connected to each other. So when we're thinking of defining the nodes, um, we can determine a number of different characteristics of what we want our nodes to look like. 
Uh, and the first one that I'm describing on this slide here is whether a node is contiguous or non-contiguous. Contiguous just meaning it's a single blob of voxels that are spatially interconnected or uh, uh, adjacent to one another. Whereas a non-contiguous node might um, contain multiple regions of the brain that are not spatially uh, attached to one another or connected to one another. Um, and on the one hand, a contiguous node fits really intuitively with our uh, idea of sort of uh, brain regions and connections between brain regions and also fits with the idea of a cortical area. Uh, however, non-contiguous nodes are also somewhat fitting to the organization of the brain. For example, we have a left and a right uh, hemisphere and there are hemispheric homologues of the same regions essentially being uh, highly similar in the left and the right. So maybe putting those together into the same node makes sense. Uh, and, and extending beyond that, there's these networks and maybe uh, could, um, treating a whole network as a node might make sense. And I'll come back to this in a little while. Another characteristic of nodes uh, to consider is whether we uh, define them as binary, uh, which is also known as a hard parcellation, or whether, define, whether we allow them to be weighted, which is known as a soft parcellation. And the difference here is that in a binary, uh, uh, for binary nodes, each voxel uh, is either fully in a node or fully out of a node, and it's only ever in one node. Um, so a voxel will have a value of one for one of out of 360 in this example in Matt Glasser's parcellation nodes, and a value of zero for all of the other nodes. And that's what's called a binary parcellation. Um, whereas a weighted parcellation means that each, no, each voxel can contribute potentially to multiple nodes um, and it can contribute to different extents. So you can have a weight uh, to say which voxels are particularly strongly contributing to a node uh, or only weakly contributing or almost no contribution to a node. Um, and again, the top one, the binary uh, parcellation, fits most intuitively in, in, uh, with a node and you can display it on this one image here because there's no overlap and there's no uh, uh, weights, there's no thresholding needed. Whereas the bottom one is a lot more complex, um, but actually that might be a useful thing if we're thinking about um, complex overlap in networks or if we're thinking about um, uh, things like misalignment or noise factors or smoothing or uh, that might that might mean that those hard boundaries are not something that we can estimate with resting state fMRI. Um, and so now that we've talked about those characteristics, uh, there are kind of three categories of approaches that um, can be taken uh, towards node definition. And I'm going to describe these as anatomical atlases, functional atlases, and data-driven parcellation. So anatomical atlases are things like the Harvard-Oxford Atlas or the AAL Atlas, and they are uh, defined in the literature, they're available in the literature, and they're usually defined based on histological post-mortem work. Uh, and these tend to not be particularly good for resting state functional MRI analysis. This is firstly because uh, they're often dis determined based on a relatively small group of subjects and therefore the boundaries of these anatomical atlases might not be generalizable to a wider population. Um, and secondly, um, determining the boundaries based on uh, anatomical information is not always the best fit for functional information. So functional boundaries don't always follow these anatomical boundaries, at least within the uh, limits of MRI. Functional atlases are also uh, are also atlases that are available in literature, um, but they've been determined based on functional information rather than uh, um, postmortem. Uh, histological structural information. Uh, and some examples are the Glasser parcellation that you can see here. Yale is one of the examples. There's many more, Power, um, Schaefer. Uh, there's a lot of different good functional analyses available in the literature. Um, and that tends to be a better choice for resting state fMRI in particular compared with anatomical atlases. 
Um, however, I've got this this um, statement here that how to map these atlases, these group level atlases onto each individual is very important. Uh, and then the last category that I have here is a data driven parcellation. And with that, I mean, uh, using the data and the subjects that you want to use for the rest of your resting state of MRI analysis to derive the nodes from that same data set. And so this is also essentially a functional method. So it's kind of related to the category in the middle, but the category in the middle of functional atlases are, they're kind of separately available in the literature. They've been estimated by other, other uh, people. Whereas for the data-driven parcellation, I mean, using methods uh, to define the nodes based on your own data that you're gonna use. For example, using methods like ICA or clustering or gradients. Um, and I have this, uh, figure here to kind of talk a little bit more about the difference between functional atlases and data-driven parcellations. Um, so functional atlases getting atl functionally derived atlases from the literature versus using your own data to estimate your own nodes. And there's pros and cons to both. So if you use a functional atlas, it's, it's easy to interpret and it's um, easy to uh, particularly interpret your findings in relation to other studies in the literature that have used the same functional atlas because you know there's a one-to-one -one mapping between how your nodes have been described and how other papers that have used the same parcellation, how those nodes were described. However, it might not optimally match your patient data, so for example, or, or your data. So for example, the node definition from the functional atlas that have been derived maybe in 20-year-olds might not be a good match to your 80 year olds or to your schizophrenic patients, for example. On the other hand, for a data driven parcellation, so when you define your own nodes, it can be a little bit more difficult to relate your results to the literature because you haven't used the same nodes. And so the difference might be because you've defined your nodes differently. Um, but it is the best representation of the actual inherent resting state organization of your sample and your data. And so which is the right choice here kind of de depends on what your research question is, uh, how it relates, like how it builds on, on, on existing literature, what your subjects are. Uh, and both of these options are, are certainly um, reasonable to choose. But thinking about which might be the best for your study uh, is something that would be useful to, to spend some time kind of looking into and justifying in your paper. We can use ICA uh, and melodic in FSL to define the nodes and parcelate the brain. Specifically, we would use group level uh, concatenated ICA on resting state data to define nodes and then maybe something like dual regression to estimate the time series. Um, one of the important variables that you as the review researcher has have to <clears throat> set when running a group level ICA uh, is, the, is the dimensionality. And so here you can see how ICA splits down the same nodes into smaller regions as you increase the dimensionality. Um, and there's not necessarily a right or wrong dimensionality because the brain is organized super hierarchically. And so uh, these Networks, you can at the top level, you can find probably 10 networks that are reproducible in the brain, but you can break down each of these networks into many different, in, into many more and more different regions. Um, and so there's, there's no right um, dimensionality, but it is reasonable to test different dimensionalities and look at how, um, how regions of particular interest are broken down or grouped together into networks. So for example, if you have specific hypotheses about the um, posterior cingulate cortex, then you might want that region to be separated out from a larger network so, so that you can look at connectivity of that region separately. So don't run your full analysis all the way up to your patient control and then based on that decide which dimensionality is best because that would be statistically somewhat inappropriate um, but you're running multiple different dimensionalities for that initial step of uh, of ICA and seeing how your data breaks down into multiple networks and deciding which is the best fit for your uh, research question is a good idea.
the next step that we're going to do is time series extraction. Most commonly is just the mean time series uh, of a node. Um, or when you're using uh, uh, ICA to define the nodes, it, it most likely dual regression. Um, but you can use other options like classifiers um, or um, something called a method called Profumo, which is um, relatively new in FSL, where it's essentially combining ICA and dual regression into one method. And it tends to be a little bit better at estimating time series for individual subjects because it does this hierarchically within the same analysis rather than separating out the group level estimation and then the subject level estimation. Uh, and in the rest of this uh, session, I'm going to talk more about how to define the edges, so the connections, the pairwise connections between nodes. Um, first thing to think about when you're thinking about defining the edges is what information do you want to represent in the edge? Um, so for example, you might just have a binary, is there a presence or an absence of the of an edge. So in this toy figure, toy example, there are three different brain regions, one, two, three, one, two, and three. Um, and one and two are connected and one and three are connected, but two and three are not connected. So that might be one type of information that you might want to represent. Um, more commonly, we might want to represent the strength of the edges. So for example, showing here that the connection between node one and node two is stronger by representing, by showing the thicker line, than the connection between node one and node three. And the last option is that you might want to look at effective connectivity rather than functional connectivity. So uh, determine the directionality of the edges. So showing that it's node one that's driving node two, um, as shown by the arrow, arrow here. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on the one in the middle, um, so estimating the strength of edges. And then towards the end of the session, I'm going to talk a little bit about directionality. So the most common approach to estimate the edges is to use the Pearson's correlation coefficient. So essentially take the time series from region one and from region two and just look at how strongly they're correlated with each other. Um, and that will give you a value between minus one and one, where one being perfect strong correlation, minus one being anti-correlation. So when, when the time series of one region goes up, the time series of the other region goes down and zero being no correlation. Um, and one question here is the question of direct versus indirect connections. Um, so in this example here, where um, there's some level of connectivity or co Pearson's correlation between region one and two and between region, region one and three, then what you'll find if you look at the connectivity between two and three uh, with Pearson's correlation or what I'm calling full correlation here is that two and three will also be connected will also show a, high, a relatively high correlation. And that's just because two is pretty similar to one and three is pretty similar to one. So two and three are going to have some shared similarity as well because they have they both share that um, uh, that correlation with the same region being region one in the same, same time series. And so this is what we call an indirect connection, uh, which um, means that there's no actual white matter pathway between brain region two and brain region three, and there shouldn't be any connection between those two regions. But in fact, there is um, because of this indirect shared common pathway. And one of the ways in which you can uh, remove this indirect connectivity, should you want to, is using partial correlation. And the idea is that if you, before you estimate the correlation between region two and region three, you first regress out from region two all of the information that can be explained from region one. So you regress out the time series of region one. And similarly for region three, you regress out from the time series of region three, the time series of region one. And then after that, you do the correlation between two and three. And you'll find that if you do this partial correlation, this um, indirect connection between two and three disappears. So you're only sensitive to direct connections. And actually, uh, I'm showing a, a simple example here with just three nodes. Typically, you have more than three nodes. And what, what, you, ha what you will do is essentially regress out all of the other regions uh, that are not in the pair. So say you have 100 regions, then you will end up regressing out 98 regions 
uh, that are not involved in the pair before calculating the correlation between that pair. And mathematically, instead of doing each doing all of these regressions and then correlation, this is actually equivalent to taking the inverse of the covariance matrix. Um, one question here is the question about how how accurate can you be in terms of estimating that partial correlation? Um, and because you're now doing a, a regression uh, of all of the nodes that are uh, not in the pair, you have to think about temporal degrees of freedom. So if you have 200 nodes, but only 100 time points, then remember you lose one degree of freedom for every regressor that you put in the model. And you only have as many degrees of freedom as your number of time points minus one. So here in this example, you have more regressors in the model then you have degrees of freedom because you have a small number of time points. Uh, so this actually isn't possible. You can't estimate this. Um, and so in order to estimate a large number of nodes, you need, a, um, and particularly to estimate a large number of nodes very robustly, you need a large number of time points. And one of the solutions here is to use some uh, form of regularization, uh, for example, an L1 norm or an L2 norm, um, which essentially means, often it means that, uh, just to get some intuition about what this is trying to do, is it's trying to reduce the noisiness of the estimation by saying, well, if, a, if the connectivity between a pair of regions is kind of close to zero, then we're going to push that a little bit further down towards zero so that you remove some of the noisiness in the estimation. Uh, and regularization for partial uh, uh, connectivity, partial correlation, is typically a useful thing to do. And how much like, regularization you need depends on how many time points ha you have relative to the number of nodes you have. So if you have a very high number of time points, then you're going to be quite good at estimating uh, the partial correlation and you might need less regularization. Whereas if you have a very short number of time points relative to your nodes, then you might need a little bit of more regularization. There is a few things to be careful about, um, particularly in terms of partial correlation. On the, on the left here is the example of Brookson's paradox. So if the directionality is such that two drives one and three drives one, um, then even with partial correlation, you end up finding a false positive indirect connectivity between uh, or indirect correlation between nodes two and three. The other example is the example of oversplitting. So this is showing how important the nodes are in terms of for any network modeling analysis, such that if, if the true node should be node 2 here, but we split that up into two regions, 2A and 2B, um, then of course when we estimate the connection between 2A and 1 and separately between 2B and 1, we will regress out the other one. So we will regress out for the connectivity between 2A and 1, we'll regress out 2B and vice versa. And so that tends to lead to a false negative where you actually don't find any correlation between um, node 1 and either 2A or 2B because you've over overly separated this node into too many regions. So that just goes to show that um, there are some things to think about uh, uh, with defining the nodes and also partial correlation is not a perfect answer to this question of direct versus indirect connectivity. Um, and an example of this, of this splitting at the right, for example, uh, is that if you have the left and the right homologs separately as two separate nodes, then that can be detrimental for partial correlation because the connectivity, the correlation between, for example, the left motor cortex and the right motor cortex tends to be really, really high. So essentially by separating them out into separate regions, you're getting into the situation where uh, those two regions are 2A and 2B and you might remove some of the real connections uh, or have some false negatives where you are not able to find those. So bilateral nodes might be better when you're using partial correlation. I mentioned that I'd come back a little bit to the directionality of edges. Uh, and if you're interested in this, I would recommend looking at this paper uh, by Steve Smith. Um, it was published in 2011, um, which shows using a number of different um, simulations. So essentially, you know the ground truth of the direction of the connectivity. 
and then it tests uh, a number of different uh, uh, directed methods for seeing how well they do at capturing that, that causality, at capturing the right directionality. And the results of that are uh, not great. Um, so essentially, estimating directionality from bold data is really, really, really hard. Um, and that's because a lot of information, because we get such an indirect measure of the neural activity, that a lot of the information relevant to estimating directionality is lost. Um, importantly, uh, don't use uh, lag-based, time lag-based methods such as Granger causality. Granger causality is a great method for um, data types, data modalities, where you have that type of temporal information available. But in bold data, in resting state of fMRI, because we're measuring the hemodynamic, we're measuring activity through the hemodynamic response function, we just don't have that information available. So if one region is slightly earlier than another region, which drives Granger causality, it might just be that the, the hemodynamic response function has a slightly different shape in that brain area compared to another brain area. So it's really hard. So Granger causality is well suited for other modalities, but not for resting state uh, fMRI. Um, and the other thing to consider just conceptually is that maybe directionality is an overly simplistic view of neural connectivity. Um, you know, the brain is a super hierarchical system that probably has a lot of feed forward and feedback connections. Um, and so most of the connections might not have a strong principle directionality because they the information is flowing both ways and so with that uh, I will finish off uh, I'll point out some resources so uh, this book covers uh, covers this in a lot more detail and covers a lot of different uh, resting state of MRI uh, analysis methods um, there's the mailing list if you're run into any problems and all of the references and all of the slide, bottom of the slides uh, have links that you can click on so that you can find, read those papers and, and find more information. Thank you very much for listening.